From the street, it is one box among many, beneath terracotta roof tiles baking uniformly in the sweltering noon. The building's gray concrete face stares out impassively in straight lines and angles. Its walls are high and wide, as good walls should be. A four-story building with four units to a floor. At dusk, the square glass windows glitter like the compound eyes of insects. Revealing little of what happens inside, there is not much else to see. And so, this house seems in every way identical to all other houses and all 30 odd other buildings nestled within the gates of this complex. It is the first lady's pride and joy, a housing project designed for gentle middle class living. There is a clubhouse, a swimming pool, a tennis court, a few resident drive luxury cars. People walk purebred dogs in the morning. Trees shade the narrow paths and the flowering hedge that border each building give the neighborhood a hush, cozy feel. It is easy to get lost here. But those who need to come here know what to look for. The swinging gate, the twisting butterfly tree, the cyclone wire fence, a curtain window glows with the yellow light of lamp perpetually left on. Visitors count the step up each flight of stairs. They do not stumble in the dark. They know which door will be open to them, day or night. They will be fed, sometimes given money. Wounds will be treated, bandages changed. They carry nothing, no books, no bags or papers. What they do bring is luck inside their heads, the safest of places. They arrive one at a time, are in couples. Over a span of several hours, they are careful not to attract attention. They listen for reassuring yelps of squabbling children before they raise their hands to knock. It is 1982. The girl who lives here does not care too much for the people who visit. She is five, two uncles and an aunt dropped by the other day. Three aunts and two uncles stepped over the night before. It is impossible to be remember all of them. They are too many names, too many faces, and they all look the same. Too tall, too old, too serious, too many. They surround the small dining table, the yellow lamp above throwing and tilting shadow against freshly painted cream walls. They crowd the already cramped living room with their books and papers, hissing at her to keep quiet. They are talking about important things, so she keeps quiet. The flock of new relatives recedes into the background as she fights with her brother over who gets to sit closer to the television. It is tuned into Sesame Street on Channel 9. The small black and white screen makes Ernie and Bert shiver and glow like ghosts. Many of these visitors she will never see again. If she does, she will probably not remember them. She wakes up one night through the thin walls. She hears the visitors arguing. She can easily pick out one particular uncle's voice, rumbling through the dark like thunder. He is one of her newer relatives, having arrived only that morning. All grown ups are tall but this new uncle is a giant who tower over everyone else. His big feet look pale in the rubber sleeper. A bad age where each toenail should have been. He never takes off his dark glasses, not even at night. She wonders if he can see in the dark. Maybe he has laser vision like Superman or maybe like a pirate. He has only one eye. She presses her ears against the wall. If she closes her eyes and listens carefully, she can make out the words Sundalo, Kasama, Talahib. The last word she hears clearly is Katawan. The visitors are now quiet but still she cannot sleep. From the living room, there are sounds like animals crying. She comes home from school the next day to see the visitors crowded around the television. She wants to change the channel. Watch the late afternoon cartoon, but they wake her away. The grown-ups are all quiet. Something is different. Something is about to explode. 
so she stayed away, peering at them from under the dining table. When the TV screen is the president, his face burning blue and wrinkly like an old man face. His voice wavers in the afternoon air, sharp and high like the same sound from a great thing. The rooms erupt in a valley of curses. Umanta ka na, makoy. Umamatay ka. Pinatay mo ang asawa ko. Umamatay ka rin. Umanta ka, papatay din kita. The girl watches quietly from under the table. She is trying very hard not to blink. It is 1983. They come more often now. They begin to treat the apartment like their own house. They hold meetings under the guise of children parties. Every week, someone's son or daughter has a birthday. The girl and her brother often make a game of sitting on the limp balloons, always floating in each in the floor. The small explosion like Guns are going off. She wonders why her mother serves the visitor dusty beer bottles that are never opened. She is surprised to see the grown-ups playing make-believe out on the balcony. Her new uncles pretend to drink from the unopened bottles and begin a laughing game. Whoever laughs loudest wins. She thinks her mother plays game badly because instead of joining in, her mother is always crying quietly in the kitchen. Sometimes the girl sits beside her mother on the floor, listening to words she doesn't really understand. Underground, resolution, taxes, bills. She plays with her mother's hair while men on the balcony continue drinking. When she falls asleep, they are still laughing. The mother leaves the house soon after. She will never return. The two children now spend most afternoons playing with their neighbors. After an hour of hide and seek, the girl comes home one day to find the small apartment even smaller. Something's heavy, hung in the air like smoke. Dolls and parents started to fight for space with plants and papers piled on the tables. Once, she finds a drawing of a child girl and recognizes a word. Class. She thinks of typhoons and blood, and no classes. The visitors keep reading from a small red book, which they hide under the bush when she approaches. She tries to see why they like it so much. Maybe it also has a good picture like the books her father brought home from China. Her favorite has two animals working together to build a new bridge after the river had swallowed on the old one. She sneaks a look over the shoulder and sees a picture of a fat Chinese man wearing a cap. The spiky shapes run up down the page. She walks away disappointed. She sits in the balcony and reads another picture of a book from China. It is about a girl who cuts her hair to help save her village from a Japanese soldier. The title is Mind Warfare. It is 1984. The father is arrested right outside their house. It happens one August afternoon, with all the neighbors watching. They look at the uniformed men with cropped hair and shiny boots, guns bulging under their clothes. Everyone is quiet, afraid to make a sound. The handcuffs shine like silver in the sun. When the soldiers drive away, the murmuring begins. Words like insects escaping from cup hands. It grows louder and fills the sky. It is like this whenever disaster happens. When fire devours a house two streets away, people in the compound come out to stand on their balconies. Everyone points at the pillar of smoke rising from the horizon. This is the year she and her brother come to live with their grandparents. Having no parents to care for them at home, the grandparents tell them a story of love words. Soldiers through into their house one summer day in 1974. Yes, Balasang came for this very same house. Muddy boots on the bridge over the koi pond. Strangers poking guns through the water lilies. They are looking for guns and papers. They are ready to destroy the house. Before the colonel can give order, they see the avery. A small sunlit room with a hundred lovebirds glittering inside. A rainbow of colors 
eyes like the tiny glass beads, one soldier opened the aid of the door, releases a flurry of wings and feathers. Where are they now? The girl asks. The birds are long gone. The grandparents say, eaten by a wayward god, but as you can see, the soldiers are stealing it. The two children watch them and their father's car client. A soldier waves as Guru says it is their father's his daughter while explaining why the gun has his own name on it. They visit her father at his new house in Camp Krame. It is a long walk from the gate, past wide green lawns. In the hot surrey, everything looks green. There are soldiers everywhere. Papa lives in that long low building under the armpit of the big gymnasium. Because the girl can write her name, the guard makes her sign the big notebooks. She writes her name so many times. The S gets tires and curl on each side to sleep. She enter a maze the size of playground at school, but with tall barriers making turn left, right, left, right. Barbed wire forms a dense jungle around the detention center. She meets other children there, some just visiting, others lucky enough to stay with their parents all the time. On weekends, the girl sleeps in her father's cell. There's a double deck bed and a chair. A noisy electric fan steers the muggy air. There, she often get nightmares about losing her home. She would be walking down the paths under the trees of their compound, past the row of stores, the same gray buildings. She turns a corner and finds a swamp or a rice paddy where her real house should be. One night, she dreams of war. She comes home from school to find a blood orange sky where bedroom and a living room should be. The creamy walls are gone, broken plywood, planks swing crazily in what used to be the dining room. Nothing in the kitchen but a sea green refrigerator, paint and rust, taking of heat patches as large as time makes. To make her home livable again, she paints it blue and pink and yellow. She knows she has to work fast before night falls. She has painted a sun, a moon, and a star on the red floor. So she would have light. Each painted shape is as big as bed. In the dark, she curls herself over the crescent moon on the floor and waits for the morning. There is no one else in the dream. Years later, when times are different, she will think of those visitors and wonder about them. By then, she will know they aren't real relatives and had told her names not really their own. To a grown-up, an old friend face can never really change. In a child's fluid memory, it can take any shape. She believes that people stay alive so long as another chooses to remember them. But she cannot help those visitors even in that small way. She grows accustomed to the smell of middle-aged strangers on the street who talk about how it was when she was this high. She learns not to mind the enforced closeness, sometimes even smiles back. But she does not really know them, though she understands the fire behind their words. She remains a stranger to their world. She has never read a little red book. Late one night, she will hear someone knocking on the door. It is different door now, made from solid varnish mahogany blocks. The old chocolate brown tie board that kept them safe all those years ago has long since yielded to warmth and weather. She will look through the big hole and see a face last seen 15 years before. It is older, garbage but somehow same. She will be surprised to even remember the name that goes with it. By then, the girl would know about danger and will not know who to trust. No house, not even this one, is safe enough. The door will be open and cracked. He will ask about her father. She will say he no longer lives there. As expected, he will look surprised and disappointed. She may even read a flash of fear before his face wrinkles into a smile. He will apologize, step back. 
before he disappears into the shadowy corridor. She will notice his worn rubber slippers, the mud cake between his toes, his heavy bag. She knows he has nowhere else to go. Still, she will shut the door and push the bolt firmly into place.